The refinement station on Garen 3 started as a dream. Tom Haraway was born with a curious mind. At 10, his attempt to rewire the home system CPU resulted in overloaded circuits, a singed dog, and some angry parents. He came to realise that science was the language of the universe and all he wanted was to be fluent. A full scholarship at Terra University led to an internship with ArtCorp's R&D department. Six years later, he was a freelance field scientist specialising in metallurgy for some of the UEE's biggest terraforming and mining corps. All the while, he had one thing in mind. Put in his time so he could build a lab of his own. 20 SE years later, he had it. Earning money on the side as a consultant and independent processing facility, he was able to piece together a top of the line facility for precious metal refinement. As the station grew over the next decade, a community began to form around it. Haraway had come here for a lab, but ended up building a town. At his core, he was still that little boy basking in the magic of science in action. His experiments only got bigger. Now, Haraway watched the unprocessed metals churn in the hydrolysis bath. Pieces began to break off and dissolve in the bubbling liquid. Haraway checked the monitor to confirm which minerals and elements the process unlocked. At that moment, a perimeter alert popped up. Strange, he thought, and looked around. The cameras outside didn't show anything unusual. Haraway was about to turn back to the hydrolysis bath when he realised something. He didn't see any people on the monitors either. Haraway set the hydrolysis on auto, pulled on his coat and headed for the door. He punched the exit code. The door hissed as heavy locks unbolted. He reached for the handle and opened. Sunlight spilled into the dark lab. Haraway's eyes took a moment to adjust as he stepped outside, but when they did, they regretted it. Six ships hovered in a loose attack perimeter. The rest had landed. Haraway could immediately tell they weren't Vandul. From the shoddy construction and awkward repairs, they looked like raiders. It was the Scourge a roving band of marauders, pirates and occasional slavers. About a dozen pirates corralled lab employees and townsfolk outside the refinery. A gun hummed against Haraway's ear. He put his hands up and turned. It was the Scourge leader, Oren Vick, a massive mountain of criminality condemned three times to the quarterdeck prison world with three successful escapes. Tattoos covered almost every inch of his exposed skin up to his hairless head. Haraway's first thought was of the old stories of the Golem, although he thought better of voicing the comparison. We's drop four metals and such, Vic slurred in a thick Cathcart accent. His tiny eyes looked over Haraway. What you have? We don't have anything. The pirate didn't like that answer. Scrum don't chaw with the belly one, other we gone spatter fawn. Vic pressed the gun against Haraway's skull. I I'm sorry, I, I don't understand. Haraway stuttered. His legs started shaking. Vic nodded to a rabid mohawked thug with facial tattoos. He grabbed Milson, a promising young geologist trainee, and dragged him away from the others. The rest screamed and shouted, but the mass of weapons kept them in place. Mohawk forced Milson to his knees and jammed a scattergun against his head. He looked to his boss, eager for confirmation. I'm telling you the truth, there's nothing here. Haraway pleaded. Vic watched him for a moment, then nodded to his thug. The thug grinned. His finger squeezed the trigger. Haraway flinched. Vic leaned in. Next one gone be real fire. Mohawk racked around into his gun and aimed again. Here, I'll show you. Haraway stepped forward, putting himself between the pirate and Mohawk. Just don't. Please, please don't. Vic took Haraway inside the refinery. A couple of pirates followed just in case. Mohawk brought his hostage. They all stared at the line of machines as if they were alien tech. See, we're in the process of refining, which means there's nothing here. All of the metal is being worked on. Oren Vic stared at one of the monitors. You wheel. What? Haraway stammered for a second. He knew he just got caught out. 
no metal here, but soon, when? I, uh, uh, there's really no tell- When? Vic repeated, stepping close. If you promise to leave us unharmed right now, I'll tell you. Haraway tried to stand tall. Vic was unmoved. When? Three months. The scourge left. Houses and stores were looted, but nobody was seriously hurt. Haraway was grateful for that, but he knew they would come back. He had three months to come up with a plan. Lock. The monitor flashed as the scanners isolated the new missile. Armitage glanced back to see it with his own eyes. Thirty years in the UEE Navy kept his nerves cool and his head level. He maintained course and speed, biding his time for it to get closer. He flashed his engines, putting his ship into a roll as he dropped a spread of countermeasures. They did the trick. The missile's momentary confusion turned it straight into an asteroid. Armitage gave the ship on his six a jink while he reassessed the situation. The client was still on course, untouched thus far by the squad of six assassin ships who ambushed them. At this rate, an executive from Maxox would hit the jump point in 20 minutes and bounce out of the rival corps' territory and into safety. 20 minutes was still a long time. Time to get serious. How's everyone doing? Armitage said into his cob. Doing great, sir, Shen replied. He twisted through space, weaving his ship between the rapid shots of a pair of assassins. He cut his engines to spin and sprayed some fire of his own. One assassin managed to dodge. The shots peppered the other. Its shields flared up, diffusing the blasts. They flickered afterwards, indicating that they were either depleted or dangerously low. The vulnerable assassin peeled off to get some distance and recharge. It turned right into a 35mm round and disappeared in a flash of flame. Lot swooped through the debris, his shields deflecting the bits of ship. Pretty low, man. You snaked my mark. Shen said, glancing back at his wingman, who attracted two pursuers of his own. Shield recharge. It's all about the kill. Lot checked his monitor's tactical assessment of the assassins on his tail when he noticed something. The last assassin was making a run for the client. Charge up, Clark. You got company. I got him. Clark's sonorous voice said over the comms. His modified Connie was perched, powered down by a cluster of asteroids, tracking the assassin with the turreted mass driver cannon on his roof. He set the detonation distance and fired. Heavy rounds sailed across the void. The assassin never knew what hit him, as balls of shrapnel suddenly exploded around him. In a matter of seconds, the ship was eviscerated. The engine was still lit and sailed wildly off into space. There were only four contacts left. One was still chasing Armitage, another on Shen, two on Lot. The assassins decided they clearly needed a new plan. They broke off and reformed. They're regrouping. Lot, shadow the client. Clark, cover. Shen, you're with me. Aye, sir. Aye, sir. Shen and Clark said in quick succession. We should form up and hit them at once. Lot chimed in. No. Get on the client. You're our contingency. Barked Armitage. Lot looked out of his ship. He hesitated for a few moments, then finally broke off and headed toward the client. Shen, Clark, we're going to go for a scoop shoot, okay? You got it, sir. Shen fell into position above and behind Armitage. Clark launched an IR beacon at a gap of space. Remote thrusters fired to hold it into position. Shen and Armitage saw the beacon appear on their scanners. Armitage swept wide to move in behind the four assassin ships who were making a push for the client. Once in position, his squad maxed their thrust and launched forward for a strafing run. Armitage and Shen quickly closed the distance to the assassins and fired a volley. Before the assassins shields faded, Armitage and Shen blasted past them, looking like prime targets. The assassins took the bait. They broke off and pursued, figuring they'd easily knock out their opponents, then hit their target. Armitage adjusted course toward the beacon while Shen swiveled his turret back and popped off shots. More for aesthetics than damage. Now! shouted Armitage. Clark unleashed a full spread of cannon fire and rockets, 
all aimed at the beacon. Armitage and Shen passed the beacon, separated and flipped their ships. It was a plan they'd pulled off dozens of times since their days back in Seraphim Squadron. The great thing about it was, if the enemy took the bait, they were sunk. The four assassin ships flew right into the trap. With the beacon as ground zero, all of Clark's arty rounds and dumbfire rockets exploded in a brilliant flash of flame, force and shrapnel. Armitage and Shen opened fire at any ship still moving. The assassins dug in to slug it out despite the sheer barrage of ordnance. It was going smoothly, until one of the assassins afterburned through the kill zone, shields and armour intact. Shen watched it head straight for Clark. Clark, power up and get out of there, he said over the comms. Lot, break off and back up Clark. Lot peeled away from the client and moved to intercept. Shen and Armitage kept up their fire. Clark dropped down from the turret and fired up the engines. The constellation slowly started to build up speed. He adjusted his fire to try to hit the charging assassin, but the ship's payload was customised for indirect fire and couldn't keep up with the fast moving target. Lot diverted power from his shields to his engines to give him an extra boost. His ship boomed with the extra thrust. 15 seconds out. Lot reported over comms. He warmed up his guns and set the targeting computer to acquire the assassin the second he got in range. He muted the comms and yelled as if he could get more speed out of his ship by cursing at it. The assassin dodged everything Clark threw at it. He put his shields front and braced himself for fire and that's exactly what he got. The assassin unleashed a stream of plasma, lasers and rockets directly at the cockpit. The ship shields flashed completely obscuring Clark's view outside. The ship shook. By the time the shields faded, the assassin had vanished. Clark looked down at the screen. It was behind him now. He was trying to redirect the shields when the second stream of rockets hit. Shen heard the explosion over the comm channel. Armitage pulverised the last assassin caught in their trap and turned to see the constellation drifting apart in four different directions. Anger raged through Lot's veins and with a resonant ping from his targeting computer, he took that anger out on the remaining assassin. Max Ox's landing park in Stanton was full of security vehicles. Armitage handled the final details with the client's assistant while Shen and Lot waited by their ships. Neither had said a word since they landed. Lot watched the client stroll into the corporate offices, smoothing the creases in his suit. If the battle or Clark's death was affecting him, he was the verse's greatest actor in not showing it. No. The executive couldn't care less. Lot shook his head in disgust, then turned to Armitage, negotiating with the assistant. Business concluded. Armitage crossed the park. Shen straightened up, almost at attention, as Armitage approached, a habit he'd never quite broken. Lot folded his arms and waited. Armitage stood silently for a moment or two. I've posted your shares to your accounts. He finally said in his usual measured tone. They were quiet again. The only sound was the hum of distant hovers and the squawk of the desk dispatcher. That's it, Lot said. Here's your payout. Call you when the next job comes up. Ease up, Lot. What do you expect me to say? That's the job, accept it, pilot. Armitage looked at him with the withering gaze of a commander. That's the job, Lot laughed. Yeah, I get that. Here's my question though, what did you charge him? Armitage was quiet. He hated talking about credits. It became an ugly byproduct of being in charge after their service ended. I charged them the rate we agreed upon. That's why they call it renegotiation. We agreed upon the rate for a low threat escort mission. They were the ones who neglected to mention that there was a hit squad gunning for our client. I gave them my word. Your word? Lot looked at Shen, shocked. 
You think that executive greaseball cares about your word? I bet he's laughing about it. He gave you scraps for pay and you're thanking him for it. Lot, let it go. Shen tried to get between them. Listen to me, kid. Armitage stepped closer to Lot, staring him down. Your work is all you've got. Everything else, the money, the ships, the fame, it's all noise. None of it means anything if you are dependable. Tell that to Clark's wife. Lot said, unflinching. See if she thinks your work was worth his pitiful share of credits. Lot stormed off and climbed into his ship. Shen started to go after him. Don't, Armitage said. Shen stopped. Let him cool off. Shen powered down his engines on the complex's landing pad. He pulled his gear from the storage bay, then head down to his apartment. Dust swirled in the fading sunlight as he pushed open the door. The apartment powered up when his key hit the scan. Lights flickered on, then adjusted to his presets. Pictures appeared in the frames. Aside from a second-hand sofa, a vid monitor, and a couple of mismatched chairs, the apartment was empty. He'd been giving himself ultimatums about decorating the place for nearly three years now. He dropped his bags by the sofa and head to the kitchen. A bottle and a glass later, he drifted by one of the frames on the wall. It slowly cycled through photos from the service. He paused it on a group shot of the Seraphim Squadron. Once 15 pilots strong, now Armitage, Lot and he were all that remained. Every time he looked at the picture, he felt more and more disconnected from that moment captured in the image. They all looked so young, so proud, so hopeful. Now it was... he didn't even know anymore. Shen went outside to his storage bay. It was getting warmer outside. He pulled open the bay door to reveal the makeshift garage. Underneath the tarp, was the racer ship he was trying to rebuild. He set the bottle on the ground, took a break from his melancholy, and worked. As the sun dipped behind the horizon, the mega city of Titus teemed with life. It was rush hour and the thick lines of hovers illuminated the airways like neon veins. Lot's apartment was dark, except for the occasional passing headlight. He stared at the floor in total silence, completely ignoring the panorama right outside his window. Thumping bass music began to seep into the apartment from the floor above. Lot finally looked up, then turned to the window. Outside, everywhere he looked, he saw lives in motion. Hundreds of thousands of people hustling, laughing, stressing. He felt nothing for them. That was new. Clark's wife didn't yell or throw things. Something seemed to click off in her. She barely reacted at all, just thanked Armitage for telling her personally and seeing that she got his share. Her voice was hollow, monotone. They sat in silence for a few minutes, then Armitage left. Her eyes never snapped out of their stupor, even as he closed the door. The entire flight home, he tried to put Clark's death out of his mind. Over the years, he'd lost dozens of men and women under his command. In every case, he justified it to himself that their lives hadn't been wasted. They had died for something. They died with honour. Something about this one unsettled him and exposed the cracks in his reasoning. Armitage reset his course to stop at a shipping hub. The silence and solitude of space had gotten to him and he needed to rest. He quickly set the ship down and dove into the main strand of shops, noise and people. He wove through the various haulers, pickpockets and pushers before finding the local watering hall. According to the customer sites, the dirty unicorn served dirty drinks and even dirtier food. It would do. 
Armitage found a seat at the bar between some armoured dreg and what he assumed was a Teverin drug dealer. The Teverin turned as Armitage sat down. You're a cop? He asked, his mouth twitching. Armitage glared at him. Got some neon. You need it? Assumption confirmed. No. Talk to me again and I'll put you down. Is that clear? Armitage caught the bartender's attention and got a drink quick. The Teverin shifted further down the bar. Got some fresh dessert too if you want it. The bartender nodded to a display case by the kitchen window. Hmm, just the drink. Armitage sank into his seat and rested his head on his hand. The cacophony of voices helped. Bathing in civilization chased away his moments of self-doubt. Three rounds later, he felt restored enough to check his messages. The Moby Glass connected with the hub's relay system and plugged him into the network. A few personal messages from distant cousins, more than a handful of ad messages, but there were a few hits through the Seraphim security contact. One in particular caught his eye. Two weeks later, Armitage waited on the landing dock. The southern hemisphere of Vega 2 was just entering into autumn, making the tide pools below especially vibrant. A chilly wind blew across the water. Shen's custom hornet raced past, circled and set down. He hopped onto the deck as the engines powered down. Both of them had independently contacted Locke, but neither knew if he was going to show. How are you, sir? Shen asked as he crossed the platform. They shook hands. Good. You get some rest? A little, Shen replied. You? You know me, son. Never had time for it. Shen nodded. They walked to the edge of the landing dock. Shen took in the view while Armitage scanned the sky. Sure enough, they saw a streak of light break through the planet's atmo and head their way. Lot's ship sat down next to Shen's. He got out, his expression still dour, and crossed to them. Good to see you, man, Shen said with a grin. Yeah, you too. Lot nodded to him, then to Armitage. So, what's the deal? Follow me, and we'll go over the details, Armitage said, and walked them over to the small lodge that acted as the local hotel and resort. He passed Shen and locked their room keys, led them upstairs, and went to his door. Armitage unlocked the door. Okay, boys. I'd like you to meet Mr. Haraway. Haraway stood up as they stepped inside. He nodded to Shen, then Lot. Mr. Haraway's got a job for us. Armitage said with a smile. They exchanged a glance, wondering what this bookish ghost of a man could possibly want with them.